everyone. I think I recognize almost everybody who is here, if not everybody. So um, I'm not going to bother introducing myself, but I do want to tell you that I'm absolutely delighted that you're all joining us tonight. Um, as most of you know, uh, The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano is one of my favorite books of 2021, and I'm very much looking forward to tonight's event with you. Um, Donna Freitas will be in conversation tonight with Pam Atherton. Uh, Pam Atherton has been an amazing partner for me throughout the pandemic and before. Um, fun fact about Pam, which I just learned tonight, is she just finished her first book. It was published in March called Overcoming Stage Fright. And when she is not hanging out with me interviewing authors, um, she is training speakers to do a better job possibly than I'm doing right now um, as they speak to the public. <laughs> Um, so without further ado, I want to turn this over to Pam and, um, we will let you know how to participate with questions and answers when we get to that part of the evening. So thank you, Pam. Welcome. Well, thank you, Terry. And I just have to say, I'm so excited about this. This is the first time we've done this a little differently. And I'm just so excited that creating conversations has created this new way to connect. Um, generally, we're in person. We can't do that because of the pandemic. But I think even after the pandemic, this might be a smart way to continue doing something so more people can get involved. So let's do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The first thing is there is a chat box there. So feel free to leave your comments in the chat box. Chat amongst yourselves about the book. Um, and at the same time, uh, Terry and Creating Conversations will put links to the book um, in the chat box, including the audio version and the ebook version, so that if you don't have it yet, um, you can get it. And by the way, if you do not have it and you bought the general admission, uh, your ticket will be used against the cost of the book. So that's a good deal. And there'll be first, uh, there'll be signed book plates for as long as they last. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we will do questions. So please uh, get ready to, to write your questions um, you know, as we go along. And then at the very end, Terry will uh, call on people specifically. Um, if you raise, there's a raise hand function at the bottom. And if you raise the hand, then she'll call on you and you'll ask your question to Donna and we'll get to that point um, closer towards the end. Then uh, keep in mind, this is live. Uh, there may be a cat across the keyboard. There may be a doorbell ringing or the guy next door has decided to do his lawn. So it's just real life. And you know what, that's, that's the fun of it. All right, so today we're looking forward to having a good conversation with Donna Freitas. And her book is called The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano. And I think many of you already have the book and we're thrilled to talk with her, but here's, there are so many things that we want to know, but I think she's going to leave us with more questions than we came in with. She's a professor and a researcher on topics related to sex on campus, to Title IX, to sexual assault, to social media with young people. Uh, she's been a professor at Boston University, at Hofstra, and is currently on the faculty at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And you've seen Donna on NPR and to the Today Show, and in the New York Times, and on Washington Post, and the LA Times. She's also the author of numerous books, but most of them have been in the YA or the middle grade uh, categories um, and some nonfiction, such as the book about social media and people. But now this is her first book that is considered adult uh, fiction, The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano. And on her website, she gives us a little peek into the future when she says, this book marks a new season in my career that you'll be seeing more of novels for and about smart women. So how in the world, so we're gonna find out from her how the world is, is taking on her book. I mean, uh, Kirkus Reviews says, following the maze of numbered takes becomes an addictive game, highly literate escapism, like watching the Queen's Gambit, highly readable and provocative. Others have called it ambitious, compelling, provocative, um, extraordinary, multifaceted, a stunning novel about loss, love, betrayal, divorce, death, a woman's career, and her identity. Wow. 
I think Donna proves this point very elegantly. In every woman, there are many stories. So welcome, Donna. We are so glad to have you here to talk about your book, The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano. So happy to be here with all of you. And I'm honored to be part of this conversation tonight and to, uh, to talk with you, Cam. So I'm looking forward to all of your questions for me. All right, so I know you've heard this question a lot. I don't care, I'm asking it anyway. <laughs> Did the book come about because of something you experienced? I mean, how much of this is you? Well, uh, you know, I, I did not want to have children. And I, from a very young age, I kind of knew that about myself. And, but it took me a while to learn that it wasn't just something that you said. Because when you spoke about it, people had really strong reactions to you. Um, mostly uh, ones of disbelief. And so as I got older, the pressure on me to change my mind became really intense. And uh, I would say I, I lived a good decade sort of tortured over this question um, myself. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to write next, I tend to ask myself when I'm like, when I'm gonna come up with a new project, what feels urgent to me? And when I asked my question, what feels urgent this particular time, I knew immediately, like the answer came to me really quickly. And that was a woman who didn't want children. Because I felt like I hadn't really seen her in literature much. And less, you know, she's sort of the, you know, the, the unhappy like spinster or, you know, the woman in the attic. I hadn't really seen a woman that might be one of my friends or even me represented. So so that's you that, that felt these things and this urgency and this need. Did you recognize or did you have any idea how this would resonate with so many other women out there? No, in fact, I thought it would be the opposite. <laughs> so when I was writing the book, I just, you know, I wrote it. I always feel like the first draft of a book is, is, the, is for me. And I knew that I wanted to write this book. I felt like I wanted to... Um, I wanted to create the character that was Rose and explore all these different aspects of what it would mean to be a mother, what, what it would mean to not be a mother in this woman's life. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, uh, I, had, I had been thinking about writing about not wanting children and someone flat out told me, don't do that. Nobody wants to hear about women who don't want children. And that was sort of filed away in my brain. So um, probably so about 15, maybe longer, a lot, many, many years later when I was working on Rose, that was sort of still niggling in my brain. And I just thought, okay, well, probably nobody's gonna want this book. <laughs> and, um, and so when, when it got bought, and I don't know if you realize this, that sold in all of these different countries, and it was so shocking to me. And it actually, you know, I thought, oh, well, I guess you can write about a woman who doesn't want children. And it, it felt kind of amazing to, to have people welcome Rose in that way. Well, I think that was the thing I found with most of the people who wrote reviews who weren't professional reviewers was they connected to it and maybe even didn't even know why, but it was like, yeah, um, you know, I, this is important and this concept of choice and I mean, so for many people, and I know, I mean, I, I do have a daughter, but I was 30 before I had one. And prior to that, there was, when are you going to have a baby? Well, you're not getting any younger. You know, um, why don't you want kids? I mean, of course you do. You just don't realize it yet. And you, you get all these things and it makes you doubt yourself. It makes you angry. There's so many things. Uh, and, and it seems like, as you mentioned, we, the, we don't see movies about well-rounded women who don't want kids. It's all crazy women or, you know, the spinsters we should have pity on. And it's true, often in culture, we get that pity look when we say, no, I, I really don't want kids. Now, you're a sociologist, so have we, has society always been this way? Well, uh, it seems that way. Um, I mean, I think if you really want to talk about this, you know, especially in this country, we live in such a religious country. And I think uh, it's, it's pretty verboten in the context of religious tradition for women not to have children. So women are often, you know, collapsed. Like they're, 
equated with mothers. And so to reject motherhood is to almost reject being a woman for a lot of people. And so I think our culture, um, they just sort of make these assumptions about women. And one of the things I've really wondered during the pandemic is, you know, is motherhood finally going to be a choice for the next generation because of what they're witnessing, uh, you know, about what's happened to women during the pandemic with regard to their jobs and leaving the workforce, but also just all the domestic labor, all the schooling falling to them and how hard women have, you know, it's been so hard for women to, to sort of carry everything. And, uh, and I think we have this, you know, generation of 20 somethings now who are witnessing, you know, what's happening to women. And the fact that even though it seems like we've made a lot of strides, it seems like we've taken a lot of strides back like during this time. And so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, will this generation finally understand that it's a question that they could have in their lives, like a choice they could make, not an assumption or an obligation? Well, you even uh, have the daughter, Addie, say in the book when Rose said, well, you know, I wanted to have this career and I'll be a professor and all that stuff and, you know, not stay home with you. And she says, what about daddy? Did he decide he wanted to stay home with me? And it was like, well, no, but, you know, it, that seems to be like a secondhand question. It's like, well, that's the mom's job. I remember my, my friend, uh, Jason, who was also a professor and a colleague, he, uh, he was the primary parent to his four kids. And he talked a lot about how, you know, when he was shuttling them around and, you know, taking them places or he would have them, you know, sitting in his office while he went to teach, everyone would sort of talk to him like he was this hero to be doing this. And he, he talked to me a lot about how, and if it was my wife taking care of them, they would just assume that that's her job. And so he felt like it was so startling that so many people were like, oh, that's so nice of you to be taking care of the kids. Um, as though it was you know, a favor he was doing for his wife. And I feel like you know, that's still the world we live in. We make a lot of assumptions about you know, if, if children are going to, you know, we're gonna have kids in the family, if someone's gonna quit their job, it's probably gonna be mom. Right, and I think also that this also, uh, human resource directors are taught to watch for this, where the dad says, hey, I'm gonna leave early to watch my kid play sports. But if the mom wants to leave early, it's like, again? You know, so uh, it's, it's a cultural thing. And I think we all have to be aware of it and then decide how we want to deal with it. And that's it. The, this opens the door to so many questions about women and choices. You know, how many choices are we having to, that are pushing us in a particular direction, whether it's our careers or anything else? Uh, you know, um, I think also culturally, because I'm fairly old, I remember, you know, you were the last one to eat, you made sure everybody else was fed first, you know, you always came last, that was your job. And I think maybe that's translating. Can we get out of that? Well, sure. I mean, that was my mom too in my house. She was the last one at the table. She was the first one up to go, like to go into the kitchen to get something else. And, you know, I felt like she was always the one who was sort of orchestrating everything and, and really not having a chance to just sort of sit and, and relax. And I mean, of course we can change those things. I think we have to make decisions around them. But I also think that, you know, one of the things that, that I certainly didn't realize when I was sort of going into getting married and, and really believing that, you know, it would be okay if we didn't have children were all the pressures that were going to sort of close in on my marriage. Because even if I had this conversation, you know, as Rose does with, with Luke in the book, you know, don't think I'm gonna come around. Like this, I do not wanna have children. I think one of the things that you don't realize is that you don't just have to convince your partner of that or your par you agree with your partner about it. You kind of have to convince everyone around you because, um, because even if you tell them this is not what we're going to do, they'll think you're going to change your mind and they'll pressure you to do it. And I think, I think that that was the part that I wasn't prepared for. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's hard to stand against all those forces. And so, 
it was interesting for me to create this character who both was going to dig in her heels and say no, and then also in some versions say, okay, and cave. And then sort of we could see what happened. And if I think if only we could do that in life, I would have been really excited to do that in my own life. I would have tried lots of different things. Um, I would have loved to have multiple do-overs like Rose does to sort of see how my decisions play out. Try it on to fit, yeah. What would happen if I did this? I mean, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure game, the book is. <laughs> um, I had it, this is just my take, everybody has their own, but I had a difficult time with Luke. Um, he went into the marriage saying he didn't want kids. Then he changed his mind. Okay, well, we all do, but he pressured her and he pressured her. And I, that really I did not feel good for me. Um, and I think that we as women feel, face that. And we often just go, it's just not worth the fight. And we give up, you know? So did you, when you were writing Luke, um, did your feelings change about him at any point in time or? or what? You know, Luke was a hard character for me to write because when I started the book, I had this sort of very tight problem where, you know, there was this marriage, they went into it saying they weren't gonna have kids, he changes his mind and she's like, no, you know, don't make me do this. So it was kind of a tight knot to work through. And I think one of the things that was interesting about Luke's character was, really trying to kind of get into his head and understand what he might be feeling and why he might have changed his mind. And, you know, I think this is one of those deal breaker issues, having kids. And it feels like a betrayal, you know, really. But you promised, you, you said you didn't want kids. Yeah, well, you know. I think on one level it is a betrayal, but I think often people get married in their 20s, right? Yes. And hey, you may think, no way am I gonna do this. And then you wake up 10 years later and you're 35 and you're saying, well, what exactly is in my life and what's missing? And you find a different answer to that question. And so as terrible it is, for a marriage to have to deal with that. There are moments when I really feel for Luke or I tried to understand and forgive him for changing his mind, I guess you could say. Because I do think it's a big decision. Like what if Rosa changed her mind right. 10 years in and said, I thought this is what I, you know, I had wanted for my life, but it turns out I really want to have a baby. I actually have a friend who is having a baby. She just decided she wanted to have a baby and she's eight months pregnant at 48 and she shocked everybody she's about to have a baby in like a few weeks and so people change their minds well indeed they do and and i mean you know like you say when you get married quite young uh you don't really know yourself you know and you learn as you go but i think um and uh, you know everybody's idea of how a marriage works is their own shtick you know but it feels like it should be a a, a journey together Oh, so you've changed your mind? Yeah, I'm not quite there yet, <laughs> you know. But but that's kind of what you did with the nine stories was you said these are the different ways it might have happened or it could have, have moved forward. It was your original idea when you decided to write this. Was it originally to do nine different lives? So originally I just knew I'm gonna write about a woman who doesn't want children. And I, but then I started, you know, roaming around. I like to walk around. I take a lot of walks and I like to think about things when I'm walking, like, what am I going to write next and how am I going to write it? And, and so it would go through my head, like, okay, I want to write about a woman who doesn't want children, but which version of her am I going to write? Am I going to write the one where she caves and has them anyway? And then she's angry and miserable. Am I going to write the one where she has them anyway? And she's really happy or the one where she digs in her heels and then her whole life blows up, or she, you know, I had all these different things I could imagine, but I couldn't pick one. And then one day uh, it was, it just popped into my head, like what if I could write all the stories? And as soon as that showed up in my head, I, I had a paper and pen in my lap and I just started like writing. I started brainstorming, okay, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And then I knew 
okay, I'm going to play out all the versions and this is going to be really exciting because I'm going to get to show readers all the different possible things that, you know, Rose might do or, or might happen to Rose because, because she's made one choice or the other. And that's really what made me sit down to write. Were all of those choices clear to you when you sat down to write? Yeah, like I knew, I knew right away what all the things were going to be for the most part, in terms of all the directions I wanted to take her and all the consequences and all the sort of um, messes she was going to get into because she said yes or no, how she was going to agree then change her mind, like all different kinds of things. And so I actually, like there, I could have done probably three more lives, but you know, I, nine was plenty. Well, and then there was, I was thinking, what if you were like almost finished with the book and you're like, oh man, I got one more I need to write. Did that happen to you? No, I mean, I the one I think that I would have liked to write about more, but didn't quite, there's a little bit of it in the story, but not as much as I would have liked is uh, an adoption thread. So Luke and Rose talk about adoption at different points and Rose is suggesting it as an option. And But I, I it would have been interesting to really follow that thread but I, I kind of didn't have room by the time, uh, you know, I, I was juggling a lot of things, so. Well, in Nine Lives, I mean, that's a great, you know, cats have nine lives. I mean, you know, that's there's so many great things to that. So I, I wanted to share a story because this is how your book affected me. I read, was reading your book, I read it, went to lunch on Friday, and um, I saw a conversation differently because of your book. Here was a woman sitting next to me. They were all girls who had gone to high school together. And the girl sitting next, woman sitting next, woman at my age, right? The woman sitting next to me said, oh, my, here's some pictures of my grandkids. Here's some pictures of my kids. I got six kids. Isn't it great? When are you going to have grandkids? When are you going to? And all of a sudden I thought, there's two women at the table who don't have kids and nobody is even thinking about them. I have a sister who didn't have kids. I have a daughter who doesn't want kids. And I have a niece who doesn't want kids. And all of a sudden I thought, well, that's, that doesn't feel good you know, because she's not considering that. And I get that we're all responsible for ourselves and we can go, I don't want to talk about this, but we're all women in a, sitting at a table and everybody wants to not cause a problem or anything. And I thought, I don't know how to change this conversation. How do we change it? You could have given him a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm like, I suggest you read this. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a great idea. You know, I may still do that. The next time we meet, look, I've got something for each of you. <laughs> but I just, I, I never would have considered it except for having read the book. And I thought that woman over there may be very uncomfortable because she chose not to have kids. And this one here maybe couldn't have kids. I mean, you know, but this woman's just going on and on. So, I mean, it was, it, it made me rethink things. So thank you for that. Um, because I would have just blathered into it myself, you know. Um, I also think that your book um, reminds us to look at our own relationships with our mothers. And, and Rose even asks it in the book where she says, you know, did you feel like you had to have kids? She asks her mom. And what would their, you know, I thought about it. I wonder what my mother's life would have been like if she hadn't had kids. I mean, she was a teacher and, and she enjoyed having kids. But would she have liked to have had a life without it? And I think this is a great conversation starter for us to have with our mothers, with our daughters. Is that, you know, anything that you were even considering when you wrote this? You know, I, um, I, I think so much about my own mother and that was such a, I think my favorite part about this novel might be Rose's relationship with her mother and the conversations that they end up having. And her mother isn't perfect, but I think she's a pretty good mom. And I think she handles her conversations with Rose really honestly and, and also in a, in a lovely way. And I think um, one of the things I thought a lot about when I was writing was so it'll be it'll be 18 years this June since my own mother passed away and so I for me a lot of the conversations that Rose has with her mother are conversations that I wish 
I could have had with my own mother, but I didn't get to have. And I think, you know, I thought a lot about when my, my mom, when my mother was dying, I thought so much about the things that we weren't going to be able to talk about and the things I had never asked her and the fact that I was never going to be able to ask them now. And I think by the time you figure out that your mother is this really interesting person, you know, that you wish you could get all this information from like, you know, in the, at the book at one point, Rose is thinking about how she wished she knew who her mother was before she became a mother. And she's thinking about interviewing women in her sociology position to, to sort of ask that question. And, you know, I wish that I could sit down today with my mother and ask her a whole bunch of stuff that I can. And so I think um, that part of the novel was so much wishing from me that I could do that with my own mother. And the nice thing about writing novels is you get to do that for your characters. And so I gave Rose all the conversations and opportunities that I wished I could have had with, with my own mother, so. Well, and I must say, um, the acknowledgement that you wrote to your mother at the back, it literally brought me to tears. My mother passed away 20 years ago and I never got to tell her those things either. And if you who have the book have not read the acknowledgements, um, please do. And if you have read them, go back and read just that one section. It is heartbreaking and uh, sorrowful, but I'm glad you got the chance to say it. Cause you know what? I think when you put it out there, the energy's out there, you know, it's gonna happen. She's gonna hear it somehow. Um, but it was really lovely what you wrote. It, it really was. So uh, I have a question to ask you now, aside from, I mean, you know, we talk about choices with women um, and uh, with around motherhood, et cetera, but the book also asks us in its own way to think about other choices in our life, lives that we may have taken a different path. So I want to ask you, is there anything in your life, are there different choices that you would have made, but you perhaps didn't or that you've considered? That's a big question. <laughs> you know what I, but I mean, not motherhood. You don't get to talk about that because the book was about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think about what if I had gone to a different graduate school? Because I had some pretty terrible things happen to me in the graduate school where I went. How would my life have been different if I had gone to Yale or Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt where I had gone into and, and I hadn't gone. Um, and I, I decided to stay in Washington DC close to home where I was at the time. And sometimes I think about how that choice not to go to Yale or Vanderbilt, if I only, if I only could have seen what had been coming for me in graduate school, maybe I could have escaped what had actually happened while I was in graduate school. So I think maybe that's one of them that I think about a lot. But, you know, I, probably the biggest one is the kids one. And it just affected my life so profoundly, my career and my marriage and everything related to it. So, but oof, I, I think the other thing would maybe be, I wish, I wish I had known, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, I wish I had known how much I would miss my mother when she was gone and that I had, I had taken the opportunity to, or take it advantage of when she was around to, to ask her the things that I would like to ask her now. I think that's maybe, I think, you know, people who lose someone they love kind of young have a lot of regrets about those things that you've lost. And this is where I feel like I, I really wish I had a whole bunch of lives or somehow I could see how things would play out. I'm one of those people who has a hard time making big decisions. Like I think about grad school, I agonize over where to go to grad school. I, I did positive and negative lists on my floor of all the places I got in, you know, and it's not that I chose poorly, but the place that I chose had pretty terrible repercussions for me as a person and my future. So um, if only I had known uh, what right. was coming, it would have been a big negative and I wouldn't have gone there. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's, that's life. If only I had known. 
if only I had known. And, you know, it all comes down to what we do with what our choices are. So I think you've done quite well with what your choices are. I'm sorry for what happened to you in grad school. But you know what? It's made you a remarkable person and a remarkable author. And I think that is something to cherish. Well, thank you. So our, our audiences love to talk about the writing process with authors. Okay. And I mean, for those of you who don't know, um, Donna is also the writing doctor. She will work and consult with people who are writing books and help them, whether it's the first draft or the outline or all the way up to polishing it. So we have an expert here and uh, let's start asking those questions. First of all, you wrote all these YA novels, young adult novels, and these um, middle grade novels, and a memoir and nonfiction, and now all of a sudden you moved into adult fiction. Any big difference in your writing style or anything you did differently? You know, I, I think I sort of see a before and after in my writing um, recently, and it's actually because, so I wrote, I wrote my, my book before Rose, was a memoir. And the memoir was about what happened to me in graduate school. It's actually it's right here next to my, my copy of Rose. And when I wrote that book, I wrote it differently than every other book I had written. I wasn't like I said, you know, or in my head, I was like, I'm gonna write a memoir about what happened to me in grad school. It was more that something clicked in my head one day, I was working on something else and I opened up a document on my laptop and I started writing it on the side and I wasn't sure if I was committed to it or not. And then one day I really just sort of let myself write. And then I wrote it very fast and I was like, oh, I'm committed, obviously, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm writing this memoir. And um, it just was such an intense experience for me. And one of the things that happened when I was writing it was it was kind of like I, I found the voice, like I have this theory that we have, you know, our internal monologue in our head when we're thinking, um, or maybe this is just me, but my theory is that we have like our internal monologues in our, you know, in our head can be different for different times in our life. And they almost, we almost have like a different cadence to them, or we might be more worried about something at some point, or we might be happier at some point. And there's a way in which I feel like for the memoir, it was like I found the internal monologue that was going through my head when I was living everything in graduate school. And once I heard it, I, I just, I, it's like it clicked in my head. And my job with that book was to go back to that person I was during that time and pull it from my head and like get it on the page. And it was such an intense experience. And after I finished that book, I thought, I want to do that again. Like, what else do I have in me that's like that? And that, you know, that was Rose. I thought, oh, the woman who doesn't want kids. Boy, do I know what her internal monologue is like. <laughs> and so I just kind of like listened for it. And um, it was a really exciting way to write. So. So yeah, I feel like there's a difference between those two books and everything else I've written by memoir and Rose. Well, there's a term that's used um, for writers and that is, are you a plotter or a pantster? Meaning, do you plot everything out or do you write by the seat of your pants, meaning that your characters tell you what to say? What I'm, I'm a total pantser. <laughs> Absolutely. If I actually, if I plotted everything out, I probably wouldn't write the story <laughs> because I get really excited to like, I, I do have that experience of like waking up in the morning when I go to write and sort of wondering like, and what are my characters going to do today? And it feels very exciting. My one exception is I, I will tend to sort of write the beginning of a novel and then I will suddenly know the end and I jump ahead, I write it. And then I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going. And then I have to figure out how to get there. And I did that with Rose. Do sometimes your characters take you places you weren't expecting? All, all the time, which I think is what's really fun about writing. And But I often feel like when they do something major suddenly, when I realize, oh, of course, this is what she's doing next. 
it feels like it's shocking at the time I'm <laughs> writing it. But then once I do it, I'm like, well, obviously that had to happen. Like, how did I not know that she was going to do this? So, but it feels, you know, it, it feels like almost like you're, you're watching a movie and you're waiting to see what happens and, and some, something shocks you. And I feel like your characters can do that too, even though they're still coming from you. Did you, in this particular case, write each storyline and then intertwine them? Or did you intertwine them as you wrote them? I intertwined them as I wrote them. I thought of it, um, I used to, so I used to play piano and I thought of it like, like the Pachelbel Canon, or even just if you think about like rounds of row, row, row your boat, where, you know, you sort of get one melody going so that like, you know where you are and then like other melodies and, you know, different keys will come in and they'll leave and then some will stay all together and then some will drop out. And I kind of imagined it like I was conducting. Um, <laughs> all the roses and like you know one had to drop out at different points and then one had to come back and then some were together so so that was sort of what it was like in my head oh that's fun i mean actually i mean really that's like and now you da 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 you know yeah, and, you know sometimes they sometimes they're they're in the same melody you know they're sort oh yeah of fun. so if you read the book and you can sort of see how they're weaving in and out and joining and then separating it would make sense i think do you have a kitchen cabinet in the sense of people who read what you're writing and give you input along the way? Or is it like, mm -mm, it's all staying here until I'm ready? My process tends to be, I'll let a very few people as in one or two, maybe see the first 50 pages to just like some of my trusted writer friends to be like, what do you think of this? Should I keep going? And, um, but once I'm committed to something, aside from like maybe a little nudge from a friend, I usually like to write the whole thing because I, because the momentum, I find that if I stop, it's hard for me to go back. And that also, um, if I get a criticism too early, that feels really hard or demit, like, you know, sort of like, oh, I should, like, I, I sort of lose my, my faith in, in writing the story. So I get pretty protective about it. So what is a typical writing day for you like? And I re realize that there are times when you, of course the pandemic has screwed everything up, but you've got teaching as well. Well, so I'm not teaching now. I sort of teach off and on. It depends on what's happening with my writing and my research, but uh, pretty much for the entirety of my writing life, I, I have the same, the same, uh, process, which is I get up super early in the morning. So this is late for me right now because I am, I like, we're talking like 3.30 a.m., 4 a.m. It's not by choice. It's just in my family. We're like a family, <laughs> like in my genes. So I, it's not like I was like, I want to be someone who wakes up at 4 a.m. I just am someone who wakes up at 4 a.m. and I've just accepted this. And so I, I wake up in the dark when everyone else is still sleeping. I make my coffee. I always have books that I'm reading. So once I've got my coffee, I read my book until I sort of feel like writing. And then I switch back and forth between um, reading my book and writing whatever I'm working on. And I do that as long as I can in the morning. And I do it every day. So when do you stop? I mean, do you write three hours, four hours? I write as long as I'm able. So there are days when I have a hard writing day and maybe I only write like a paragraph or two, but, um, but if I can go for hours, I'll go. Like if I have a day where I'm just really like the words are like the words, like I can't type the words fast enough, which are great days. I'll go as long as I can until I feel like I I'm done. So it's really, it just depends. So writer's block. You get writer's block. Um, I have, I have at different points had writer's block. I've been pretty lucky in that regard because of um, my, my dissertation director, I feel like is the person I owe my writing habits, my psychology of writing. A lot of people 
are traumatized by their experience writing their dissertation, but I happen to have a wonderful director and he had all these theories about writing and they still define me. And one of them he said to me over and over again, when I was getting ready to write my dissertation and when I was writing it was, Donna Freitas, this is not your life's work. Forward, forward, forward. And he was like, there's gonna be other books People spend 10 years writing their introduction and they never graduate with their PhDs. You're not gonna do that. Just tell yourself, this is not my life's work. And you know, because there's gonna be other things, I just have to write this one book. And that's been in my head ever since I defended my dissertation. And his other theory was like, six months is plenty for a draft. So like, don't spend longer, just get it out. And then you can always go back and revise. And so he had all of these all these ideas about how you got your dissertation done and they were wonderful and they've just become how I work with every book I've written. So how long approximately does it take you to write a book? Well, there's like the first draft and there's all the revisions. For, right. for me, I'm a pretty quick drafter. So I wrote the first draft of Rose in two months. But I did, I mean, I just like poured it out every day. Like I went to Rose, like she was my therapist. <laughs> we had to like, you know, like, or my psychoanalyst, like we, we talked every day. And so that's how I am with a first draft. Like, so usually for me, it's like two months, maybe three, maybe four, six is long for me, but sometimes. Um, but then revising, I feel like, is a really long process. And, you, and I go through a lot of drafts. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you're revising a book for a solid year. That's all you're doing. Yeah. All right. I know that our audience has questions for you. So, Terry, if you want to come on and um, talk, you know, pick out the people that have the questions for Donna, because I don't want to take all of her time. I'm happy to do that. So maybe the easiest way to do that, if uh, there is a reactions uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And if you click that, there's a raise hand function. So if you have a question and you'd raise your hand that way, then I can call on you. Everyone can unmute themselves uh, whenever they would, when they're called on to speak. So, so we'll try that, but I'm gonna start because I've had a burning question ever since I read this book, which has been some time now. But first, before I do, I just want to state for everybody that um, Donna has now set a new standard for all of our authors. Um, and that is, is that their dress or their whatever they're wearing should always match their book cover. And um, so I thank you for that because actually she did that as a favor to me because I saw her do that in another interview. <laughs> um, so st standard set. Um, so here's my burning question. I love the format of this book so much because I'm all about, not all about, but I think often about different paths taken. So my question for you is this, would you ever use this format again? Someone just asked me that <laughs> and I thought, could I? <laughs> so, like, could I, and you know, could I take another big question a woman's life and play it out in this way. And uh, it got me so excited to think about it. And it's funny because I, I had actually been thinking about, I really, I really agonize over everything. Like I lay awake at night and I like play out all the possibilities, which is part of why it was so fun to write Rose. Like it's just write, write them all. And I had been thinking about, um, I have been thinking for a while about writing a book where, uh, what if, what if you were told that you could change one thing and only one thing in your past? Like, what would you, what would you change? And like, how would you figure out what it was? Because you wouldn't necessarily, you know, what if your life had taken a wrong turn? Um, and then, but you got a chance to go back and do something different, but you don't know what it was that took, that made you go on the wrong turn. And so I'm, I'm very interested in all of those sorts of questions. Like, what are the things, what are the major decisions in your life that really matter, that can really sort of shift things? But I have to say, since someone asked me if I would almost do like a sequel to Rose, like, but with maybe another 
question, you know, that, that a woman had to answer, I can't stop thinking about it. So maybe, maybe. Somebody else had a question. Um, Mar yeah, Marlene. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, you're up at three and four, four in the morning and you're writing. And um, I understand all that because my best ideas come kind of at that hour of the morning too. I get just a, a light bulb that goes on and it's, it's very exciting uh, solving a problem at that hour. Um, do you go back then the next day, the next morning, and uh, do you go back to what you've written the day before and, and edit that, or do you just keep moving forward? I, I tend not to. One of the, by the way, it's so nice to see your face and, and talk to you directly. Um, you. Nice, nice to meet you. You know, that Happy was- to meet you. That was one of the rules that my dissertation director gave me was try not to do that because you can get stuck, you know, revising and reading the same thing over and over again. Right. You know, just move, look forward, look forward. You can always revise after you're done with right. the draft. And so I try to keep that as a rule. I try to move forward. The only time I go back and reread is if sometimes if I'm struggling a little bit to get going for the day. I can sort of use the prior chapter or like a page or two, like an on-ramp, almost to remember what it was I was writing so I could get back in the mood. Um, but I, I don't do this thing where I'll go back. I have some students, I had this one student who told me that she would, like every day she got up and wrote her everything she had written up until where she wanted to go forward. And I was like, don't do that. <laughs> That's why you can't get your book done. So, um, but so I, I try to limit it. And the only other time I do it is if, you know, sometimes you, you almost can't remember what's in your story. And I'm like, what was the brother's name again? <laughs> and I have to like go back <laughs> and pick it up. So sometimes I'll do that, but mostly just for information. All right, well, Liz, I, I, you're I, up. I, have, I just, I have to be honest that I have not read the book yet. Terry gave it to me and I'm looking forward to reading it even more so now oh. that I met you and, and heard what you've had to say. Thanks, Mom. Liz, you're up. <laughs> hey, hi, Donna. I wanted to, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed the book and I found myself um, rushing to get to the next Thomas part because that was my favorite story <laughs> of life. Like she just seemed so much happier with him, even, you know, the one when she was pregnant with him and then when she didn't have a kid with him. And I just really enjoyed the whole thing, but loved the Thomas sections the most. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you for telling me that. It's yeah. nice, to, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So Donna, I sort of have an add-on question to that because it seemed to me that, that her real issue was the marriage. Even more so, right, than, than the child decision in some ways. Can you talk about well, that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize, one of the things I didn't realize when I started writing was that, oh, this is also a book about marriage. <laughs> this is a book about marriage and divorce. And I, it, was, it was when I was already in it, uh, pretty far in where I thought, oh, this is, this is really a book where I am like asking questions about what makes a marriage, what makes a, a couple happy, what breaks apart a marriage, uh, what does it mean to go through a divorce? Uh, you know, maybe some relationships no matter what you do in them, they're, they're not gonna work out. And, you know, I think when, when I was going to write the book, I knew right away, oh, they're, they're gonna have a fight about something really stupid in the beginning. Like really, it's something that seems really minor. And so they fight about, you know, the fact that, for those of you who haven't read, that like, you know, Luke, Rose's husband, Luke, asked her to take prenatal vitamins as like a gesture toward the idea that she's trying to be open up children. She said she would, but then she resents the fact that he wants her to take him, so she's not taking them. And so the book opens, so like the, the nine lives turn on this fight. They have about the vitamins and they have it again and again and it has different outcomes. And when I thought of that, I was like, oh, that's such a married fight, isn't it? 
because it seems like you're fighting about something small and dumb but really you're fighting about the entire marriage. Like you're fighting about your whole relationship from something that seems small. And that felt so like marriage to me. And um, cause I feel like that happens a lot where you like your relation, you're, there's a referendum on your relationship because of how you load the dishwasher. And so anyway, I, I guess as I was in it, I realized, um, oh, this is this is really a marriage book. And I actually just had, I've had a lot of really intense reactions from readers uh, from this book. It's the, definitely the most int intense reactions I've ever had from readers in my life. Like people like pouring, like writing missives. Like I wake up to these long letters from people. But I had two women recently who specifically said that um, they were giving it to their friends because they felt like it was one of the best divorce books they had ever read. And I was like, huh, like, so their takeaway was divorce <laughs> from the book, which I thought was really interesting. Anybody else? Okay, I have one more. Okay. <laughs> and then Pam, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> so, um, I was sort of struck at the end because, you know, m most, not all of the lives were, you know, repeat, you, there was uh, several chapters to them. And at the end, you sort of like threw three of them at us in, a, in very short order. And I just wondered if that tempo was on purpose or sort of, I think, I can't, let's see, I actually, let's see which lot. Yeah, I think it was seven, eight, nine, right? Um, we talk about that? Well, so there's the, like, I, as a writer, I sort of felt like, you know, more like, like the, the earlier lives that you get are just have a bigger arc because of where they fall in the narrative. And so part of the idea of the structure of the book is that even though Rose is making different decisions, um, and so it's taking your life in different directions, that the book was building an arc as a whole for Rose and for everyone in her life too. Like, I don't know if you realize that even though Rose, Rose's light veers in different directions and because of that, so does Luke's, everybody else kind of holds steady through the book. Like I wanted to give readers something to hold on to. And so toward the end, my hope is that, you know Rose so well in so many different ways that you kind of already can get a sense of like, oh yeah, I know this, of course this is happening now. Like, of course, Rose, you're doing this. And so the arc gets kind of shorter um, because I feel like you've already like give, you've already been in her life so much. But, um, but yeah, some of that is just yeah. like, to keep the momentum, but also because there's only so much space in a novel. Well, and I did think you did an amazing job with the larger arc. And, and exactly what you said and keeping all the other characters sort of going in the same direction. It was just, it, it was just beautifully done, so. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's a very important book. And, and you know, you asked some questions that I think we have to ask ourselves. And uh, those of us who are mothers, do we miss that life pre-child? Would we have done life differently if we had chosen not to have kids? Um, that's, that stuff that those who are mothers can ask themselves, but it's also a great conversation starter, I think, with the people in your life. With And this is why you suggested it, and, and you're darn right. This is the book that you should get for your mother, for your sister, for your friends, for your daughter. You know, I mean, like I said, my daughter doesn't want kids. My niece doesn't want to have kids. Let's read the book and then talk about it. You know, do you feel that society is is shaming you? Do you have issues, you know, one way or the other? So Mother's Day is coming up. And even though this book is about the choice to not be a mother, although we know things go differently, it's a good conversation starter to get into a deep conversation um, more than just a frivolous, hi, mom, here's some flowers. I, I really, and like you said, you wish there were things you could have asked your mom, you know? Well, this gives you the chance to open that conversation. And again, I want to mention that you'll see in the chat, there is a link to getting the book, to getting the ebook, and to getting the audio book. If you bought a ticket and you do not have the book, as Marlene does not, you may, or actually you did get it from Terry, um, you may uh, use the, your, uh, your 
ticket as um, a, against the cost of the book. And you will get a book plate as long as there are still book plates around uh, a signed one by Donna. So it's really, um, it's, it's a great book. It's an interesting book. It's a definite conversation starter. And, you know, finally, Donna, what would you, when you wrote it, you know, what did you think, this is what I want the audience to take away from the book? I wanted, or I want women, regardless of whether they are mothers or they are not, to find themselves spoken for in rows somehow. My hope is that the book is flexible enough to accommodate the many different ways that women live their lives and the choices that they make. And my hope is that it's a celebration of women's choices, whether that's about motherhood, marriage, divorce, career, friendship, their own relationships with their mothers. And I really wanted it. It's not a polemic about, it's really in the end, it's not a polemic about, you know, oh, a woman shouldn't have children or a woman should, not, should have the right to not have children. I think it's really, I hope it's a book where women will really see themselves, you know, in, in rows. And I also thought the end is written in a certain way. I won't give it away in case you haven't read it, but the end is a way where I kind of hoped that by the end of the book, the reader would be able to choose for herself who Rose was or who Rose is in the end. Um, and that maybe that, you know, who we read need Rose to be will change over time, depending on the time in our life that we're reading it. And so I really hope for readers that Rose is whoever they need her to be by the end. Well, and I wanna say thank you because as I told you, having read the book, you gave me a whole new perception on that conversation. And to realize that I was part of the problem too, because I would have just been like, yeah, normal conversation, not realizing how it could have been um, very, perhaps very difficult for others there to listen to. So thank you for that. That's, it, it's an eye opener. We all need to you know, be learning and getting better. Um, uh, and obviously you have more books in you. <laughs> how are you working on another one now? I am. I, I'm working. I sort of have two going on, and I'm not sure which one I want to be next, and I have to figure that out soon. So I will help you. What are they about? <laughs> I'm not ready to say. Oh, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> Do you think also there's a possibility that something like this book might make it to Hollywood? Oh, uh, I hope so. That's actually going on right now. There's been a bunch of uh, interest from uh, from like film and television interest, and I've been having conversations about uh, the different people who, who love Rose, how they would like to adapt her for a TV series. So like a you know like a nine episode TV series that you see like on Netflix or something. Well, there know. there would have to be at least nine because there's nine lives, but then the first one to set it all up and the end one to give you the end. So hey, that's thirteen weeks. You've got it. <laughs> and, um, and and we look forward to it. Will you keep us surprised of that? Oh sure, I'm very I'm very excited. Like I hope that happens. It was really fun to have these conversations with people who who want to bring Rose to life on the television. Well, and since we know you've got more books in you, will you come back with the next one? Oh, of course. I would love that. Well, we this would love to have fun. you. It's this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for having me tonight and for everyone who's come and for you all for hosting me. So. Well, thank you for this. And, and thank you again to Creating Conversations who created this uh, conversation with Donna. And um, we look forward to having more of them. Again, if you'd like to get the book, check out in the chat function. You will find a link to it there. You can also find out more about Donna by going to donnafreitas.com. And the spelling, you've got it from the book and everything else is F-R-E-I-T-A-S.com. And of course, more about Creating Conversations by going to Creating Conversations 
book.org. By the way, it, you know, we really feel it's important to buy from as many independent booksellers as you can. So whether it is this book or any other books that you are interested in, please give Creating Conversations a chance by going to their website and seeing if there are books there that, you know, maybe you have this one. Oh, you may find another one that you need to have or you need to gift to your, your mother or something along those lines. So for all of that, for Terry, for everyone else, thank you so much for being here tonight. And we look forward to the next opportunity to spend time with you in another conversation. Thank you, Donna. Oh, thank you guys so much.